Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jen Shonger from the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence, the NJACE, which is funded in part by the New Jersey Governor's Council and the New Jersey Department of Health. I'm so happy to be here today with Rachel Dorsey. Um, before I introduce her, though, um, to go over a couple of housekeeping notes, we are live on YouTube right now. The recording will be available to watch at any time after this. Um, and we will have uh, both Spanish and English captions uh, in the near future. Um, we do encourage you to ask questions or comment, and just remember that you'll need to be logged into your YouTube account to do that. And we love hearing more about you. So if you're comfortable, please feel free to let us know a little about yourself in the chat. Um, so with that, I'm really happy to introduce Rachel Dorsey, who's an autistic speech language pathologist, educator, consultant, and autistic advocate. Through her private practice consultancy, Rachel Dorsey Autistic SLP provides education to parents, professionals, school districts, and organizations through coaching, consultations, in-services, professional developments, and courses on neurodiversity of forming therapeutic practice. Welcome, Rachel. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you for having me. Um, and I guess, uh, yeah, I'm excited. And so I guess with that, we'll, um, I'll, get, I'll get started. Um, I am today discussing writing goals to uh, foster autistic identity. Uh, so writing goals as a, as a clinician. So, Okay, I will start off with a little bit more about myself and the picture you can see that's me and my cat Oliver who is the love of my life and you might see in the background, perhaps or, or maybe just walking like in front on the desk. Um, I am a speech language pathologist. I mainly work of pediatrics, um, all pa pediatric ages, although I, I have seen some adults. Um, as Jen mentioned, I am autistic and um, I received a diagnosis about two years ago and then an ADHD diagnosis about a year and a half ago. Um, because I'm autistic, uh, my communication during this presentation um, might look a little different than um, the pres presentation style of of other guests um, that aren't that haven't been autistic. Uh, I I sometimes script out my entire presentation. I have not done that today. I'm just going with uh, me me talking with a, a few notes here and there. So um, I might sometimes lose my words or I might sometimes pause and rephrase things. And uh, I'm just letting, letting you know, know in, um, in advance. Okay. Um, and yeah, I own um, private practice consultancy, Rich Dorsey Autistic SLP LLC. Um, and like Jen said, I, I provide a variety of um, services. I've been a speech language pathologist for almost um, six years, um, with that focus being on pediatrics. And currently, um, the focus is seeing autistic clients or clients with ADHD. Okay. So I'm not going to read through this um, list, but um, I want to acknowledge that I would not be able to do the work that I do without the um, labor of um, past and current longstanding autistic advocates, particularly um, particularly advocates who are of color. Um, because uh, their their work is uh, is critical and um, is most likely to be erased, uh, and um, so I want to particularly highlight um, those individuals. Um, all right, so um, today's uh, talk 
I am first getting into theory. Uh, so um, going into social identity development theory, disability identity development, and autistic identity uh, development. So it's a little more academic in the beginning. It's a little more theory in the beginning. Uh, but uh, uh, then, and then I talk about uh, implications of um, incomplete identity development. But then I, I uh, transition into uh, the effect of, of poor of poor goals um, as a clinician writing um, goals for um, for autistic clients um, and how that impacts uh, identity development of those autistic clients before finally getting to the title, uh, Goal Writing to Foster Autistic Identity. And there are uh, two case studies that I run through. Okay, and so um, this first slide is more text heavy, but I promise not every slide is going to be uh, very, like very, very text heavy, just as this one is. Um, so first I'm talking about social identity uh, development theory. So, um, I guess before I really get into it, I wanna say that, um, Social identity theory and social identity development theory. Uh, the the there's a long history of work with um, in the social justice uh, literature, and it would be impossible for me to um, to 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 name everyone who has um, contributed to um, this body of of, of literature. Um, and um, so I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best to, to um, cite those that, that, uh, that made relevant contributions for, the, uh, for this particular context of this particular uh, presentation. Um, so Social identity development theory is an adaptation of social identity theory. What is that? Well, um, Tedge Fell in 1979 um, published a, on uh, social identity theory that it's a person's sense of who they are. That's It's based off of uh, their belonging to the social world. So your identity and more so your social identity is, ba is based off of your belonging uh, to the, the social world. And so then, um, literature uh, progressed and, um, there was an adaptation of black uh, identity theory and and um, white identity theory, and so you know uh, the marginalized community, the black um, community, um, and you know the the uh, oppressor, the white community, um, that was adapted. Um, to apply to the development of identity. So how does identity develop? And so identity develops in the context of um, a, a socio-cultural context. So when I say that, I mean a context of economic, political, cultural and social oppression. And the development of identity, it's a development, so there are stages to it. Um, I'm going to briefly go over each of these stages because um, they are similar 
to uh, the next slide, which is on disability um, identity development. Um, this, uh, uh, so yeah, so first, um, uh, and I'm talking about these from the perspective of the, uh, the marginalized community member. Um, so the first is being, being naive to, to being in that marginalized group and being naive to the social um, differences between social identity groups, but then getting a little older children are um, learn, learns uh, through making uh, mistakes within their, their social identity group. Um, they learn some about the boundaries of that group. Um, next is acceptance. And so um, that is when uh, members of the marginalized group um, actually uh, identify with um, and accept the uh, kind of the dominant paradigm. Um, Next is resistance, where there is a heightened um, awareness of um, the economic, political, cultural, and social oppression, and the way that it impacts um, both the individual in that marginalized group and, and the group dynamic. Um, then is redefinition, uh, which is, um, this this uh, experience of trying to kind of reframe your your own um, experiences through a more affirming lens. Um, and finally, we get to internalization in which um, members of that marginalized group um, are able to integrate, um, um, aspects of their life into their, um, their identity as being part of that marginalized, that social group, um, and, um, develop a sense of pride. And, uh, the stable identity is essential for a positive sense of identity. Um, and you'll see that concept later on in this presentation um, specific to the autism literature. Um, uh, Quinones Rosado um, takes all of this kind of a step further and um, states that each stage of development progresses as a person perceives recognizes, understands, and responds to the developmental challenges faced at each stage. So um, how you progress through each of these stages um, depend on uh, the challenges that you're faced with and then how you, how you respond and perceive them and everything and understand them. Okay, so into disability identity development, which is an offshoot of uh, social um, identity uh, development theory. Um, there are also several stages, not not as many, um, but but they're they're very similar. Um, I, first, there is a passive awareness, which is that you don't recognize um, the disability in, in yourself. Um, and then um, you uh, realize that you have some differences and are trying to find your place within society. And then finally, uh, viewing yourself as an equal and
and developing and embracing um, group identity as it pertains to the particular disability that you have. So then we get to autistic identity development. So positive self-identity is linked to positive mental health outcomes. Um, that's well established in, in the literature. Um, with ableism being the main barrier um, to autistic identity development, according to uh, autistic uh, adults and autistic advocates. Um, and I use, um, there are many definitions of ableism. I, I like this one, it's a little more multifaceted. Um, ableism describes discrimination towards a social group, in this case, disabled people but it also describes how certain ideals and attributes are valued and not valued. So I like this definition because it describes the discrimination, um, but it also describes um, valuing and not valuing certain um, attributes, which I think is particularly relevant to the autistic community. And um, the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network um, states, many of the barriers faced by autistics and others with disabilities arise not from the condition itself, but from prejudice and stereotypes that have the effect of excluding us from full participation as citizens with equal rights and responsibilities in society. So clearly ableism is um, a big factor in um, autistic identity development, being able to progress through those stages that I mentioned earlier. So then the question becomes, do traditional goals, and so when I say traditional goals, I mean goals that are commonly seen um, in, in schools often, often in, in um, clinics to try to uh, uh, get uh, through insurance, right? Because insurance has a very deficit-based um, ableist um, model of uh, approving things. Um, yeah, yeah, traditional goals do do promote ableism. Um, so I'm gonna get I'm gonna get into that um, more. So okay, what what is wrong with goals? So this isn't actually a goal specific thing, but I wanted to throw it in here because it's important. Um, autistic clients often don't know that they're autistic. Um, so how are they supposed to move to, for, to, to progress from passive awareness to realization to acceptance? How are they supposed to move throughout those uh, stages to um, having a positive self identity when they don't even know that they're autistic. Um, so, uh, I mean, I find that a lot of goals are written with the, um, with um, autism itself, like not, or autistic, like not being referenced at all. A lot of paperwork, like that's avoided. Um, parents don't want to tell their children and th that that can go off into a whole other talk but um it's important that children that people know that that they're autistic okay so uh what else is wrong with with goals um i find there's often a presumption of incompetence that's embedded 
into the goal. So this can look like uh, like um, a client having to like given um, eight options of foods to request. <laughs> And then like, oh, they're not picking anything. That means that, um, that means that they don't know what any of this means. And, and like, then they get stuck with the same goal year after year. And then the goal is eventually downgraded to like four options instead of eight. Um, when really it's like, uh, do they even want any of those things? Do um, uh, does there is there motor planning and and sensory um, regulation and executive functioning? Um, are those those differences aren't being taken into consideration? Um, there's a big emphasis on masking. So there's a big emphasis on um, on teaching skill skills. I put in quotes um, for the autistic client to not seem autistic, and I'll get into examples of that. Um, Everyone else's comfort is more important than, than the client's comfort. And so people, and what I mean by that is people are um, uncomfortable with, with disabilities. People are uncomfortable with um, obvious displays of neurodivergence. And so um, the aim in the goal is to downplay all that in the client for the comfort of everyone around the client. Um, there's no supports or not enough supports to promote autonomy. So um, often, or I would say like nearly all the time, um, autistic people need supports in, in some way um, to, uh, or in certain settings to um, be more um, successful, however they define success. And um, those often are not uh, really taken into consideration with goals. There's this really big focus on, uh, on independence without, without really realizing that no one is independent. Um, we all uh, have supports um, in, in some way or another. So, um, as a result of, I mean, goals certainly contribute to this and can contribute to this, but I, I, I'm talking more so about um, uh, goals and, uh, and uh, society and um, not knowing you're autistic, all these things coming together, we end up with, autistic people thinking that they're bad people or that they're broken or that they're they're an alien they haven't found their community they don't feel like they belong anywhere and so when autistic people aren't given space to grow that that identity well, if they don't even suspect that they're autistic, they're often, and I say they, uh, I'm autistic, just like to prevent confusion here. Um, I guess I'm going like, we clinicians, they autistic, although I am both. Um, so they're often depressed and anxious and have no idea why things are harder and why they keep missing the mark and why they're exhausted and um, 
they don't they don't have any sort of concept that there is an identity out there that fits. And if they suspect they're autistic, but aren't quite sure, they often really don't know what their true self and their mind and their body well enough to even capture um, through words or um, through to communicate their own experiences. And, and if you're, you know, you're, you know, you're autistic, or you're pretty darn sure that you're autistic. Um, they, they often struggle to capture, capture that, that, um, inner state and own experiences leading to a lot of invalidation of identity from everyone around them. Okay, so now moving on to goals. <laughs> goals themselves. Um, so I'm going to have on the left a goal, a traditional goal, and on the right, implications um, regarding that goal um, and um, what it does to uh, autistic sense of identity. So client will engage in conversation about, um, about non-preferred topics for five or more minutes. That is a common goal for autistic clients? Well, the implications are that the client's current preferred conversational topics are unimportant. And in fact, the client's social needs, that, that need for social bonding in an autistic way, in a way that aligns with autistic identity, is actually incorrect. And that the client needs to socially perform in a non-autistic way to be accepted, to find their place in the dominant, in the, in the neurotypical, in the kind of neuronormative, is that, I don't know if that word there makes much sense, and in, in, in the dominant group to, to fit with that identity. Um, the next goal uh, that I, I'm, I'm talking about, I think five total. Okay, maybe a six. Okay. Um, next one is that the uh, client will select a correct object card given four choices. So in this type of a goal, like I alluded to earlier, um, the client's sensory differences, as well as motor differences and executive functioning differences are all invalidated. Like th those play an important role, whether the client is actually able to, to, to execute that like demand placed on them. I mean, also emotional regulation um, is relevant here too, because it is a demand and a lot of um, autistic people have difficulties when demands are placed on them. So I could have put that in there as well. Um, but ultimately, this is a demand that that depends on performing on the spot. And it isn't taking into consideration any of these differences, and thus is invalidating um, important aspects of um, the autistic experience and thus autistic identity. So the client is presumed to be incompetent. They're, they're unable to, uh, to maybe do six choices. They were reduced to four choices. 
you know, these types of goals, I often, um, I mean, as someone who used to write these types of goals, um, it would often be like one day, 20% accuracy another day 50 percent accuracy another day 80 another day 25 and it would just bounce all over the place and um or it would be like 75 percent and then for like a month be like 25 percent and it'd be like oh the 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 client has regressed in their skill they suddenly had some this knowledge of language, but um, poof, it's it's gone. They regress. They don't have it anymore. It's just autism. That just happens with autism. Um, so there's a lot of presumptions that could be made uh, depending on um, how the client is responding to this goal. But ultimately, the client is. Um, is gatekept from access to robust communication if they're unable to perform. Um, these types of goals are largely um, done in order to collect like cognitive and linguistic prerequisite data. Um, and if you know this four choices isn't happening, then they don't get access to um you know they don't they don't get access to a a robust form of aac because the logic is well how can they possibly uh if they can't even select an object card given four choices how can they you know, meaningfully press a button on a um speech generating device. So um, if you're not able to access a robust form of communication, that's obviously a huge barrier to developing a, a sense of identity and, and connecting meaningfully with others um, in, in your um, social group. Um, next one, client will identify perspective of others and problem solve ways to repair the breakdown. Um, all right, so implications with this sort of a goal. Um, with these perspective taking goals, it's, it's often that the, there's the assumption that the client is at fault and they're autistic because they're autistic. Um, and their own perspective is secondary or doesn't matter. And when I say doesn't matter, I mean, um, it isn't really even conceptualized within to the clinician or the team that the autistic client has a perspective like it actually exists um the, and and um it's it's just the focus is on trying to to un understand the perspective of the the, the non-autistic uh, person or group of people. Um, and because the autistic client is at fault here, it's the, that client's responsibility to repair the breakdown. Um, So this leads to a uh, false dichotomy of, well, non-autistic people, um, their perspective is good and right, and the autistic client is, um, their perspective is unimportant, doesn't matter, or is, or is just wrong and bad, and it's all up 
up to them. So obviously you can see that uh, this, this um, well-intentioned but uh, poorly worded, and I propose an alternative to, to this, um, uh, this well-intentioned but poorly worded type of a goal um, does really delegitimizes um, the autistic point of view um, and is a huge barrier in developing um, autistic identity. Next goal, a uh, client will increase joint attention and engagement by orienting to the clinician's point and eye gaze and having their body and face orient towards that clinician. And this type of a goal, I, um, I like an engagement type of a goal, I, I see um, and even like really well-meaning clinicians who like are really trying to educate themselves on um, the autistic experience and like doing things in a more neurodiversity affirming way um, still get kind of hung up here um, because they don't realize that um, the client is already having a way of connecting with others, but it's through this type of a of a goal, you're you're shifting the the autistic client's way, way of connecting. It's deemed wrong, or the client's way of connecting already is not even really noticed. Um, there's a lot of really um, subtle ways that autistic people um, demonstrate a, like engagement and bonding and connection and um, paying attention and uh, and through not having a careful eye towards those things and a careful you know using all your senses to 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 um, to see that um, that's invalidating autistic identity. Um, this type of a goal is also saying that non-autistic demonstrations of engagement are superior. And so ultimately, if you're if, if the client's natural ways of trying to connect are either trying to be shifted or completely not noticed, their own socio-emotional needs are unmet, which is a huge barrier to developing a positive sense of um, identity. Okay, this is the last uh, traditional goal. The client will increase words spoken from 10 words to 25 or more words. So the implications, um, so the, I, I see this goal often with clients that are um, apraxic. Uh, and so, and, and there's the focus on unspoken words. Um, and so the implication here is that well, I mean, they have difficulty speaking, they're apraxic. That makes them appear more disabled. And that's a bad thing. We need to increase the amount of words said so that their disability or their neurodivergence isn't as obvious, which creates shame in in the um, you know difficulty speaking or inability to speak. 
Um, it also um, reinforces that, that mouth words are more valuable than other forms of communication. So even when, um, you know, it's like uh, a lot of times AAC is the last resort, a robust form of AAC is the last resort. And so that that is creating shame and and and, and embarrassment and um uh around around using alternative methods of communication and it's also um creating a uh or or contributing to this to the already established like cycle of uh of AAC being seen as um less desirable um so um yeah that that's not that's not good <laughs> for autistic sense of identity particularly for um I mean, for every, I mean, this can go for um, partially um, speaking autistics or non-speaking um, autistics. Okay, so what can we do? Um, you'll notice that I've highlighted um, things in certain colors and you'll see why in the next slide. So the research is clear that in the autistic population. There's a link between group membership and positive self-esteem. But autistic people need access to um, communication or or people that, well, and or like others that respect how they're currently communicating uh, to participate in a group. Uh, self and community advocacy is important for positive self concept. And that includes uh, sensory supports, educational supports, community supports, um, and acceptance of things like stimming. But also autistic people need some type of uh, grounding or knowledge of what is even going on with themselves in the first place. So from there, we go to what best helps autistic clients thrive autistically. And I'm starting off with self advocacy. So uh, that means can the client um, self advocate, and this includes community advocacy too. Um, can can they consent or dissent? Um, can they deny or ask for help or ask for accommodations and supports? Or can they provide explanations for things that they do um, socially to be better understood? Um, there, I mean, there there are a lot of ways to um, to, to self advocate, um, and and building up self advocacy takes a lot of 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 time and effort. I'll say that right now, um, but it's it's important. Uh, especially for these skills to be fostered when when young. Um, functional communication. So um, I mean a broad range of communicative functions um, through a variety of communication modalities. sense of purpose and belonging. So does the autistic client feel a sense of purpose and belonging? However, they define that. Um, so that could be in the classroom, that could be um, in, uh, uh, in 
in their their group that they're in? Are they given opportunities to interact with um, with uh, uh, neurodivergent um, no other 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 neurodivergent people or autistic people? Um, sensory and emotional regulation. Um, is the client covering up um, their sensory and emotional dysregulation? Do they have strategies and tools in place? Hopefully including a staff that can, or, or um, parents or a team or some people that can help them, that can co-regulate. Um, and 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 do they have some awareness of of where they even are feeling wise? And finally, executive um, functioning supports. Um, so, does the client have um, supports in place to help with uh, learning new with the executive functioning aspect of learning new skills? Um, this could be in the classroom or in um, college or in employment or um, in the house, uh, a variety of, of places. Okay, so going to case study one. Um, this is a seven-year-old autistic child. They have a dual diagnosis of autism and ADHD. And they talk really passionately about tractors whenever given the opportunity. And they get really frustrated with class assignments and um, give up. So here are just like some traditional goals that you might see, like improve expressive and receptive language. These aren't going into as much detail as the ones I mentioned earlier. They're only a couple words. Reciprocal conversation, you might see. Appropriate eye contact, you might see. Following several step directions, you might see. Um, identify when they aren't coping, you might see that one too. Um, some of these are better than others. That one I can I can see going in a potentially positive direction. Um, and yeah, being able to ask for help. Again, I feel like that could go in a, in a positive direction. Um, so I propose, I think I proposed three goals. And I'm not saying that these are like all of like the right goals, but there's some there's some ideas of of where where to go um, to help the the child um, uh, foster a, a positive sense of identity. So first, we have being able to start to identify their own feelings. Um, and my goals tend to be lengthy, so here we go. Given unrestricted access to executive functioning supports such as visuals, like a body chart, our emotion wheel, and a co-regulatory partner, child will categorize the differences between their sensations of various feelings and emotions using pictures, actions, body language, gesture, written typed word, drawings, and spoken word, in one-to-one -one and group sessions. So in this goal, we have the supports embedded into the goal. We have um, starting with just categorizing differences of sensations because that is often really, really, um, that's kind of step one. <laughs> Just being able to sense what is actually going on and starting to kind of piece them apart. And we're going to respect the various modalities that the student or the client, uh, client can, can use here. Um, 
and I put in one-to-one -one and group sessions because I wouldn't expect this to generalize uh, within, if this is in a school district within like an annual review period, I would expect this to be a, a, a something you're working on kind of long-term. Well, okay. So this child's seven. Uh, I understand that um, a seven-year-old uh, doing perspective taking is uh, unreasonable, and that this, it's uh, that's not a skill I would expect from a seven-year-old, any seven-year-old. But I uh, think that discussing different communication styles as just a fact, as something to be learned, would be very valuable. Okay, long one. Given unrestricted access to emotional, sensory, and executive functioning supports, and li like list them, put them in there, embed them in the goal um, so that they're not forgotten about um, uh, and explanation of autistic communication styles and neurotypical communication styles through videos, real life examples, and nonfiction, child will demonstrate attentiveness to various perspectives by identifying the unique and shared non-spoken forms of communication, spoken forms of communication, and socio-emotional values through spoken word, written typed word, drawing or pictures, and group sessions. So this is another kind of categorizing, like what's autistic communication like? What's neurotypical communication like? Just so the child has some understanding that there are differences um, to lay the foundation for later on when you go into, into perspective taking. Um, goals, um, which I think any, everyone could benefit from, um, not just our autistic kids. Okay, last one for this child, um, self-advocacy. Oh, a little piece of the end there got cut off by the arm. Okay. Um, given unrestricted access to emotional, sensory, and executive functioning supports, once again, list those, and visual supports to describe bodily feelings and sensations and their associated feeling and emotion, the child will describe uh, or will demonstrate use of self-advocacy skills by indicating a need or clarification, wanting to work in another setting, feeling emotional or sensory overwhelm and needing a break, needing a combination of tool or tools through pictures, da 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 you know, the communication modalities I already uh, spoke to. So um, this goal, uh, once again, similar format has the, um, supports right in there. It has um, the um, the uh, like various types of self advocacy uh, in there. Um, uh, I in order for a client to self advocate um, something like um, uh, like in the certain needing of certain accommodations or tools, um, or knowing what setting they want to work in, they need to have some sort of idea of where they are at, um, in terms of, of their body and their emotions. So, um, it kind of depends on that other goal, at least making some progress with it. And one more, this one only has two goals that I propose. Okay, so this is a 15 year old autistic child 
who is a non-speaking um, and uses a combination of sign and vocalizations and actions and light tech AAC and high tech AAC. They use LAMP words for life to communicate. They have an intellectual disability. They really enjoy Clifford the Big Red Dog with their special interest. They like to be included and next to others, but not necessarily all, all in it. Um, they have a high degree of sensory motor planning and executive fun functioning challenges. So they benefit significantly from routine and warning about changes and a sensory friendly environment. So traditional goals for this child might look like work on that requesting on AAC, um, just hone in on that requesting food or toys or something like that. Uh, it might work on uh, age appropriate interests because um, society, a neuronormative society would say that Clifford the Big Red Dog be, being the interest for a 15 year old isn't entirely appropriate. Um, and, and I mean, that significantly diminishes uh, autistic you know, sense of um, identity. Oh gosh, I, I really strongly dislike age appropriate interests. Okay. Um, increasing social, yeah, it might be like, yeah, increasing social communication. This, this is a student that, or a client that um, just likes to be next to others, but let's really push them, push them to, uh, be be more be more social be more interactive um uh and and have a lot more friends uh categorize things by number and shape and color this type of a goal would be uh likely for like gaining employment um like skills needed for employment so I propose two goals. First one's a functional communication goal. Um, so same format, given that unrestricted access to those supports and unrestricted access to AAC, clinician modeling, and faded hand under hand prompting. The child will communicate for a variety of functions, including request, comment, answer questions, express opinion, and initiate and end an interaction using multimodal communication, including their AAC device, American Sign Language, um, I should have put in here, um, Light Tech AAC too, modified sign language, vocalizations, verbalizations, actions, gesture, body language. Um, I put in here, uh, I mean, I'm very specific in exactly how I want this goal to be targeted because um, with any of these goals with any students um, or any clients, if, if I write the goal and I'm seeing this, the client and then for some reason I can't see them anymore, um, and another clinician takes over. I want it. I want this the the client to be protected in this goal. I want the goal to, uh, no matter what, not be like misinterpreted. I th this is a goal that aims for for um, that I think aims for like fostering um, positive. Um, identity and uh, and I'm saying this is how <laughs> this is how, uh, a way to, to do it. Um, and yeah, we're respecting um, the different, all different um, types of communication here, um, going from actions and vocalizations 
to um, more symbolic forms of communication, such as AAC or um, sign language. And goal number two, um, same, uh, same supports, um, but the child will self-advocate concepts such as refusal, requiring assistance, express preference and disapproval, and emotional or sensory overstimulation, and social, social preferences using um, all of these multimodal communication um, modalities um, and light tech AAC, which I did not include in here for some reason, but it's just as important. Um, I, I want to, um, oh gosh, I had a thought in my head that I wanted to point out and now poof, it is, it is gone. Um, oh yeah, that it's very likely for this student and the other student, um, but particularly this student, that that these things like the communicative functions and these types of self-advocacy the student is already doing, um, these uh, through like action or through vocalization or verbalization or whatever, but the communication partner is just not picking it up or responding to them or um or it's purposely being ignored and this type of a goal is saying no we're going to pay attention to it we're going to validate it while also working towards more symbolic form of communication okay so yes speaking of communication partner all these goals require a responsive, respectful communication partner or partners to, in order for the autistic client to, to, to do that progress, um, make that progress towards acceptance of their identity and to um, foster positive self-worth and to feel self-actualized, all of these good things. Um, so that means that like the team and the, and, and the parents and, and everyone in the community, um, they're all in, play an important role as well. Thank you. <laughs> this is me and my website, and my email, and my social medias. And yeah, that is my uh, talk. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rachel. That was so wonderful. Um, yeah. And uh, to everyone, we'll get to some questions now. So if you do have questions, please let us know. Um, I wanted to say first that I loved your goals and like, one problem that I've always had with the way goals are written, which is summed up by how you rewrote them, is they never discuss like what the support people are doing to ensure no. access or success. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm, yes, I'm very <laughs> aware of that. And I know that like in an IEP, like in the accommodations, it says that, but there's no data being taken on those. Right. Um, they're often like just forgotten about. Um, so putting them right in the goal is a way of, of, of saying like, if this isn't in place, it impacts my ability to do my job yes. for, for the student. Yes. Like it, essentially it's a goal for the professional as much yeah. as it is a goal for the student. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I love that. And it's really like, that's, it, it makes so much sense to have it that way because really, but I mean, the adults need the support as well, especially if they um, are not neurodivergent or, you know, like, like if some of these things are new to them and, and thinking in these ways, um, I'm sure it's certainly helpful to have this written out in this way for them as well. Yeah, I, I, 
try, I, like I said, I try to, the primary aim was to protect the student mm -hmm. and, and, but also guide, guide who, whoever else ends up inheriting the goal into what, here's what you do. Here's what I had in mind. Here is what you do. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. And I think you're, you're definitely doing that with these goals. Um, I'll give you a comment first from Marge Blanc, who says, I'm in awe of how you've put together all the elements of humanity, perspective, and education. I think we, we do what we do because of our inability to hold on to the gestalt of life. Bravo. <laughs> oh, thank you, Marge. Oh, so, so kind. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So next we have a question from Louisa Gatto, who I think said before they're watching from Canada. Oh, um, okay. Hi. So, <laughs> how can a clinician support a client when the family does not want to, to disclose the diagnosis? Yeah, that is, that's really hard. There's several ways to do that. Um, if, if the family doesn't want to disclose the diagnosis. First of all, it depends on like what set, like how much, how much um, your ability to like build rapport with the parent. Like, are you seeing the client at home and it's a home based therapy type of a thing? Um, are you seeing the client at school? And so interactions with parents is kind of every now and then. Um, I mean, I, I, you could help the, the, the parent, um, gradually, slowly, uh, because clearly the issue here is that they view autism as being like a, not a great, a, a great thing. And um, they, they might not want to admit that, but it's the autism as being shameful and um, they um, helping the parent uh, work through those biases. Um, I also recognize that like, I've had much more success doing that when like, through like early intervention than mm -hmm. I have when working with like a 12 year old whose parents don't want them to know they're artistic. Cause it's like, I feel like by that point they've, I don't know, I feel like by that point, like society has done like so much damage and like the, they're, it's, it's really hard to, to undo that. Um, as far as goal writing, um, most of the things that I proposed um, could work with the exception of well of I wonder her. what maybe certain parents would be open to describing something as just like a different community. Yeah, exactly. Time. Yeah, so in this type of a goal, it would be um, it, it would be ex explanation of various communication styles and just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. And um, the seven year old probably wouldn't figure out that they're autistic. Maybe, may maybe they might. But like, if you had this type of a goal with like a 16 year old I could easily see them um putting the pieces together that that they're autistic and you you didn't you didn't tell them your you, this goal was was agreed upon by the team and you didn't you didn't I mean the parents might then say like oh well, they learned about it in your session but it's unlikely that you would get in trouble with with anyone by your supervisor because you were literally just sticking 
to the goal and the concepts of the goal. So it's not your fault that the student figured out that they were autistic. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's really, that's really hard. I can go several yeah. directions in my head about like, how exactly do you help parents get like, go and like, accept um, their autistic child. But um, that's also could be a whole other talk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to, I'm jumping around on the questions a little bit, but there's a similar question from Kristen Davis, who says, how do you balance parents want for other types of goals that may not endorse a positive autistic self-identity? For example, parents who want to teach their child neurotypical social skills. Um, yeah, that's also really, really tough. Like a parent that's really, really insistent on like, yeah, that like social relationships look a certain way. And so, um, um, I, it is hard and I'm not I'll, sure. I, I'm not sure I have a great answer for that. Um, I, I think that a perspective taking, if it's a kid working on like social things and they're older, like a perspective taking goal would be pretty widely accepted by everyone. And so um, I, I think something like that, like goes over well. Um, if they, if they're really insistent about like talking about non-preferred topics and, um, and talking and like, you know, eye contact and, um, and those sort of things, um, Ah, oh, man, to be honest, I, I haven't been placed in a situation where a parent has been quite that insistent. It'd be a really difficult situation for me. Um, I might try to take, I, I would, I would probably try to try to take, um, a, a, a goal that I would, typically write something like this and really water, water it down significantly, but still the, that type of parent wouldn't be happy. They wouldn't be happy until they got it like specifically how they wanted it. And so there's not really a, a great solution is there. Um, yeah, I mean, possibly uh, include like the goal that they really want, but then also like really bulk up a self advocacy goal, and um, and like really really focus on on that, um, and just take take data on the other thing, while really really focusing in on that self advocacy goal. Yeah. And hopefully, I mean, with, there are a lot of resources available now that talk about, um, you know, the, the, the detrimental effects of masking and the double empathy problem and things like that. So maybe like some gentle steering, you know, toward those sorts of resources, just, you know, just to, to help get people thinking more about this, because obviously, I mean, most parents have the best of intentions. They want, you know, they want good things for their children. And I think, and we actually have a talk coming up um, January 13th, actually, um, with Dr. Priya Lavani, which will be exploring a lot of the pressures that especially mothers uh, get put, you know, that get put on them. Um, and, you know, exploring ableism and um, then she'll come back and talk more about ableism in the schools as well. But I think that so much of, of the pressure that parents feel are, are from, you know, even looking at the traditional goals, like that all kind of gets ingrained mm -hmm. in all of us. And so there is so much unlearning involved, but it can't 
it's not like a, an overnight process. Yeah, that's, that's a great, that's a great point. The like gentle nudge and, and then like, and then kind of stepping back and then another little gentle nudge then kind of stepping back. Um, I've, yeah, I found that to be very, very helpful. It, it's very hard in the, in the moment when, when you have, the parents still want what they want and it's like meeting time and you know but in in the long term that approach is very is very helpful yeah um okay so this is some this is a branching off of this so from anjali m any suggestions of resources like books or videos that can be used communication styles um you froze can you repeat that question oh yes um any suggestions of resources like books or videos that can be used to describe autistic communication styles and nt communication styles that's a that's a good question um because there's not great um autistic uh representation in the media. Um, I really like um, the the show. Um, oh, gosh, I and now I, I'm, I'm very bad of proper nouns. And so of course, I forget the show. Um, it is um, everything is going to be okay. Yes, it is. Um, the the um, director is autistic, and he's also one of the actors. And all the autistic characters are actually autistic. Um, there's also neurotypical characters in that show as well. Um, so that's that's a really good one. Um. um um I'm trying to think too. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, that one is 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 quite good. And there's two whole seasons of it, so you know, enjoy. I I wouldn't recommend like something like um Big Bang Theory, which I know is like a favorite of people to be like Here's like the funny, silly, awkward, like autistic physicists. Um, I wouldn't recommend that because that's a kind of a caricature of of, um, autistic communication. Um, Trying to think of others. Um, There are um, actually, um, I, I mean, there are, there are like short films, um, like slash documentaries on autistic people. Like I just watched, um, this isn't about me. Um, and something like that, I mean, like she's, uh, non-speaking, but, uh, there are many things I could point out about her, her communication that is consistent with autistic communication. So, um, communication first, um, has, um, some good videos on, on non-speaking autistic people and, and like body language and mannerisms and, well, not specifically on those subjects, but it's like, these are things that you can discuss as far as, and there, you know what? Now that I'm thinking, like, there's YouTube. There's YouTubers that are autistic. There's yeah. um, Stephanie Bethany, I believe, is a, um, and there's oh, um, autistic Kayla who um, is a uh, a aut- like she has an autistic or she has an account and she's autistic. There's like you could yeah you could find it. Now that I'm thinking, there's all sorts of things that you could find um, on online on YouTube for as far as like autistic communication. Um, and I know even like, there's a lot of, um, like 
social media groups that discuss this. And also just um, in thinking about like researchers who have kind of written about this, I always talk about Vikram Jaswal as well. He um, has, he and his team, uh, like he works with non-speakers and um, like they've written papers about the, the differences. Um, I know that one piece was about um, being versus appear, being versus appearing socially interested. And so, mm-hmm. you know, it goes into that. Um, and then the person had said to, um, if no specific resources, how do you approach explaining these different communication styles to your clients? It depends on the age. <laughs> um, and it depends on, on, on like meta cognitive metalinguistic awareness mm-hmm. um yeah i mean it like it it depends on 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 that really um i you know i could create a a, a chart or like a right write down like what do you what like you know what what do you notice that's different or like like leading questions what I or I could just explain it um I um I uh or I might um you know a client might have um uh some autistic friends from like an autistic um like social skills group that they're in and then also have like neurotypical friends and then perhaps they um don't feel as close with and then um talk to them about like their comfort levels with you know various groups and then kind of use that to kind of bring out a discussion Mm -hmm. um it just yeah it just really depends on on the client and where they're, where they're at. Right. Okay. Um, I will move on now. So, um, other people are thanking you. Thank you, Sharon, for your comment. Um, Judy Bailey says, thanks, Rachel. I love that your goals are so thorough in detailing the givens in each one so that these factors are not lost. Brilliant. Um, okay. From Haley Sue. Um, and I apologize if I mispronounced your last name, Haley. Um, she says, how do you recommend we make goals measurable for those workplaces that require it? Yeah, that's, that's really, <laughs> that's really <laughs> hard. I, I mean, I, I, um, I didn't include it here, but like I, everyone has like a, a measurability thing that kind of works for them. I like some people hate opportunities. I like opportunities, like 80%, 70%, 90% of opportunities. Um, but I make it more measurable by specifying like the location and who's taking the data, um, and by what method, like checklist, by, um, language sample, by, um, by classroom observation. Um, yeah, so um, it, 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 that like, that's, that's just how I do it. Um, the, something like, something like um, this type of a goal. Um, We'll self-advocate. I would probably um, uh, do a lot of language sampling and um, and a lot of uh, like really checking, not really um, being, very sensitive to where the client is at to, to and and probably co-regulate and and see if if there's a uh, 
opportunity for self-advocacy. It's kind of hard to say with goals like this, because like, you know, what is an opportunity? What's not an opportunity? Um, but I'd probably take chat, like, you know, it's something like, okay, today or not, or um, the reality is that, um, that, The we're trying to make something that is isn't um we're trying to take like really truly like helping someone from from uh like like foster their sense of identity and then like put a percentage on it and yeah. that's really really hard to do and so like I, like d like do your best I mean some are easier than others like a um something like this one where um they are identifying unique and shared non-spoken forms of communication da, da, da. that's easier to just like take data on um on okay they're categorizing things um but um yeah it's it's hard i use a variety of modalities to take data and the exact measurability i i try my best by saying usually like you know 70 percent of opportunities through this way in this setting by this person with so-and-so peers yeah it's hard it's hard and you know you like you're so great at this and like please know that we don't expect you to have all the answers either and and like you said like um so much of this especially when it comes to communication it's like if you're putting these predetermined numbers on them you're almost dictating what the person's going to say which pretty much removes the like the autonomy of the mm -hmm. communicative intent of a person so it is very tricky and um i'll just add as my very non-professional um self but i remember seeing i think um gail tatenhove who has um like aac goals um in the iep um i my memory is fuzzy, but I remember seeing her like writing the measurement part a little bit differently than I was used to seeing because it's like, especially with people who have more motor differences, um, I feel like she was measuring it more of like, you know, say like four or five times in or like in four out of five classroom activities or like something like that. So it's like, it was more about the opportunities throughout the day versus, you know, pre predetermined contrived right. situations. Yeah. I've, I've, I've seen that type of a thing too. Um, and, and like, I, I don't like even like that 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 I I I I get because it's like there are different classroom activities and then um like I guess you take data on um a any any um, communication that happened during those those activities but it's it's hard because it's also not taking into consideration like what if those activities are just boring that has nothing to do with the communication yeah um it's like there's no there's no perfect system for for the data keeping aspect when because like these are these are our, you're dealing our with people, people. <laughs> yeah we're dealing with with people and and uh we're dealing with people in a very personal um way and um I just I just try 
try my best. And I, I guess I, my recommendation is to try, try your best too. It's, it's hard. Yeah. Um, okay. So with that, um, let's just do, we have one last question if that's okay with you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, from S L T E S S um, as an SLP, have you ever suggested to a parent for the first time that their child may be autistic? Who, if anyone, do you think has the authority to make such a suggestion and how? That's, that's an intro. I've seen that like debated online in like SLP Facebook groups. Um, yeah, I've, I've mentioned autism for the first time to a lot of, for a lot of parents. And I have a, oh, I have a very particular way that I, that I do it. And I have a video on my website. Um, I have a video under, under videos on uh, how, how to first bring up autism to parents, a step-by-step -step guide. So if you're interested, oh, awesome. you can check, check that out. Um, but um I, I, I mean, yeah, I, I think that like in, in, like ASHA makes it pretty clear that, that SLPs are, are able to, to first bring up autism, like, and, and, and ASHA, from my knowledge, even states that if there are, if there's like a lack of resources, um, we can do like a thorough evaluation and diagnose that. Don't quote me on that. That's like my current understanding, but we can definitely like mention it to, as a possibility to, to families, um, yeah, I mean, I guess the only time is that I've heard people say, oh, no, no, SLP is like, we can't do that is, or, or you, Rachel, the SLP, you can't do that is when I've worked in a setting that was like very autistophobic. Um, so yeah, that was, that was my experience with that, but other settings and, and, and what I do currently, like, well, no, right, right now it's like parents come to me if they, they have an autistic kid. Um, but previously, yeah, I, I brought it up many times. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, all right. I'm going to give you one last comment from Marge Blanc. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So Marge says, thank you, Rachel. You are so good that I think we tend to place a lot on your shoulders, but there are a lot of us thinking these, thinking these days. So you don't need to take on more than your share. Oh, so. thank, thank you. Thank you, Marge. <laughs> um, I want to thank you as well, because this is all really significantly important for us to think about and how how we write and talk about and teach autistic students does influence how they feel about themselves. And um, I'm, I'm very grateful for all that you're doing to teach the professionals in the community. <laughs> and um, thank you to everyone else for joining us today as yeah, well. Yeah, thank you so much. And future <laughs> people, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so again, you guys can rewatch this whenever you like. Um, one question people were asking Rachel was whether you might provide the slides. Um, yeah, I can, especially because like they have the goals in there. And so yeah. people probably want to want to look back. Yeah. I didn't yeah. show my references. They're my references. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I can, I just send those to you, Jen. Yeah, that's perfect. And we will post them. Um, and um, thank you so much, Rachel. Yeah, thank you so much for having thank me. You.